Our message this morning is really the continuation of a two-part series on John the Baptist. And uh, I don't even believe you can take two complete sermons to do justice to this incredible character from the Bible. Uh, as I've been studying more, I'm getting a great blessing and uh, a little embarrassed that I didn't, I wasn't better acquainted with John since he basically is at the beginning of all four Gospels. Matter of fact, I'll remind you that the word John means Yahweh is gracious. And I thought it was interesting that the New Testament begins and ends with John. Of course, John the Revelator is the last book who says, even so, come Lord Jesus. And John the Baptist said, Jesus is coming. At the beginning of the New Testament, you've got the grace, God is gracious, John the Baptist. He's saying the Messiah is coming. And then you've got John the Apostle at the end of the Bible. He says, even so, come again. Isn't that interesting? And both of them mean God is gracious. Now, probably I should begin with a little review. Uh, last week, we were talking about that uh, prophecy in the Old Testament, last verses in the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, Behold, I send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And then, of course, we go to the New Testament and there the angel says that John the Baptist would come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So we began to look at some of the parallels between Elijah and John. And I think when we left off, I had come up with five. Let me review them for you quickly. There's about 12 of them. Both John and Elijah were fearless in their preaching and bold even before kings. And in the case of John, it cost him his life. The message was for the church, one of revival, repentance, confession, first and then the world. Three, they both had very simple, austere lives, wearing camels, clothes, leather belt, living in the wilderness, being fed by ravens and eating locusts. He, he lived a Spartan life showing that he had gained the victory over the uh, appetite. And simple clothing, of course. And they believed in discipling others. Both Elijah and John had disciples. They took what they learned from God and transferred that to others. Now let's pick up with some new similarities between John and Elijah. They both spent time at the Jordan River. Can't escape that. Remember, Elijah said to uh, Elisha, I'm going to the Jordan. The Lord has sent me to the Jordan. And it was that last miracle of Elijah before he went to heaven was parting the Jordan, a symbol for death in the Bible. Baptism in the Jordan was a symbol for death, burial, and resurrection. Of course, where did John baptize? By the Jordan River. They both manifested humility, very humble. Elijah, he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and he prayed humbly before the Lord. John, he said, he that is coming after me, speaking of the Messiah, is mightier than I. I'm not worthy to untie or to even bear his sandals. Both lived during a time of religious persecution, led out by a prominent woman. During the time of Elijah, Jezebel sent a messenger. This is from 1 Kings 19, verse 2. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the life of one of those prophets you killed by tomorrow. And he fled from Jezebel. And then with uh, John the Baptist, it was Herodias, the wife of the king. In both cases, it was the wife of the king, these pagan women that persecuted the prophets of God. I thought that was interesting. Now, I'm going to take that a little further. During the time of Elijah... Jezebel and her daughter Athaliah worked together to destroy the prophets of God and the seed of Israel. You with me? Athaliah killed all the royal seed. Jezebel killed the prophets, tried to kill Elijah. During the time of King Herod, Herod the Great tried to kill all the babies in Bethlehem, the son of David. And then you've got King Herod, his wife Herodias, who wanted to kill John the Baptist and ultimately did. And the daughter of Herodias danced. She participated. So you got this pagan queen and her daughter manipulating the king to kill the prophets of God. Then when you go to Revelation, Babylon, this woman and her daughters, persecute the prophets of God for a period of 42 prophetic months. 
How long was the famine during the days of Elijah? 42 months, three and a half years. Do you see the parallels? Well, there may be another time for Elijah to come before Jesus returns. Oh, wait, I'm not done. There's some more parallels here. They both ran before the king. And I'll get to that in more detail. Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18, the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. He girded up his loins and ran ahead of King Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. And John the Baptist said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the paths of the king before the Lord. I'll talk about that in a moment. Point 10, Elijah's message will point people to the Lord and the message of John the Baptist. Remember what Elijah prayed on Mount Carmel, his great triumphant moment. He said, hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord, that you've turned their hearts back again. He tried to turn them back, a message of repentance and pointing to God. What was the message of John the Baptist? He said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He pointed people to Jesus and said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do we need that message in the last days? Point people back to the Lord and to uh, encourage them to repent. They both had moments of discouragement. Elijah fled from Jezebel because of Jezebel. He's in the wilderness and he says, Lord, let me die. I'm not better than my fathers. John the Baptist in prison because of Herodias. He sent a message, Jesus, are you the one or do we look for someone else? Was I wrong? And then finally, I think it's interesting as my final point here. Elijah went through the Jordan River with Elisha. Elijah then goes to heaven and the work of Elisha takes over. John goes into the Jordan River with Jesus and from that moment on, the work of Jesus expands and the work of John the Baptist diminishes. And uh, many, many parallels. I just took some obvious ones here uh, just to tie off our study from last week. Now I want to begin today. It's uh, John the Baptist Part 2, A Voice in the Wilderness. And I'm drawing that from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, and whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So here in the Old Testament, it says, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. You remember we talked just a moment ago about John identifying himself as a voice in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Preparing the way comes from the terminology of a custom that when kings traveled in ancient times through their realm or even visiting other kings, that they had a road crew that would go before them that would do several things. They would announce the king is coming and they would inspect the road because they did not have Caltrans back then. And uh, when the king went by, you didn't want his chariot bouncing and jarring him. And so they would fill in the potholes. The low places will be filled in, John the Baptist said. They would cut off the molehills. They'd cut down the high spots. They'd widen the narrow spots. They would basically prepare a road as direct and smooth as possible for the king to pass over. The work of John the Baptist was something like the work of these people who went before the king in that he was preparing the way to make the path straight for the Lord to reach our hearts. I think it's interesting that when you read about the conversion of Paul, you know it says when Paul was baptized he was staying on Straight Street in Damascus. I just don't think that's a total um, coincidence. And the Lord reaches us when we're on Straight Street. And God wants us to live straight, doesn't he? Shortest distance between two points is a straight line. The reason some people's lives are crooked is because they follow the path of least resistance. You know how a river gets crooked? Same way. It follows the path of least resistance. And if we're going to live a straight life, there's going to be resistance. John the Baptist came preaching a straight message that people should live straight. Now, cutting down the high spots, some people are too proud and they must be humbled. Filling in the low spots, some people don't know how valuable they are to God and they must be lifted up. Uh, the work of a good preacher is to make the comfortable uncomfortable and to comfort those who are uncomfortable. Do you get that? Some people are uncomfortable and we're supposed to preach comfort to them and some people are too comfortable and we're supposed to make them uncomfortable. 
And that's sort of the job of a preacher. Well, John the Baptist came to do that. Those who were the outcasts, he said, God wants to reach you. Those who were religious pride and haughty, he called them a brood of vipers. And he tried to encourage them to repent. And so he was preparing the way before the king and helping to remove the obstacles. And also, their job, the road crew, was as heralds to announce the approach of the king. Now, if you were to ask John, who are you? He said, I'm not Moses resurrected or Elijah reincarnated. I am a voice. When you think about a person and who they are, most are attracted to external things. John identifies himself as simply a voice to announce the word. Jesus was the word incarnate. John was a voice incarnate. But he was the voice to prepare to receive the word. A messenger. You know, you've probably been at, maybe you haven't, you ever seen any of these um, special official government occasions where people come to a dinner and they actually get to the door and they are announced? Uh, maybe you haven't been to one. You've probably heard about them or seen this before. And you've got this herald that meets them at the door. Maybe you hand your announcement sheet and it announces them. I've been on the platform before where my job is. I am the platform chairman for some highfalutin camp meeting. And my job is to announce everybody that's on the platform, and they all sit there uh, through the whole thing, and what their degrees and qualifications are. And uh, John was the one who was to announce to Harold to introduce Jesus. Now think about how important that work was. All of the Old Testament prophets talked about Jesus. They all pointed to Jesus. But they pointed ahead. They said, we've seen him in vision. Let us tell you what it's going to be like. We're going to give you a few clues. It was all done through revelation. John the Baptist was not just a prophet who was to announce Jesus. He was the one who basically could look at the reality and say, there he is. Think about how important that work was. It wasn't like the prophecies of Jeremiah or Isaiah or um, Ezekiel or even Daniel who talked about the coming Messiah. John said, here he is. And the spotlight came on and he began his ministry. He had the privilege of being the prophet to transition from the old economy to the new. John the Baptist was the threshold. His prophecy, his ministry was the threshold. Threshold is not a very big part of the yard of the house, is it? John's life was very short, but it represented the changing point between the Old Testament economy where they sacrificed physical lambs and the Lamb of God and the new economy. Can you see how important that was? That's why all four Gospels begin before Jesus, you have John. He was the messenger. And um, what was his message? Luke chapter 3 verse 2, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Did God feed the children of Israel with bread in the wilderness? And this was the bread of life, his word. John chapter 1, verse 22. They said, Who are you that we might give an answer? He simply said, I'm a voice. Quoted Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The important thing about my life, it's not what I'm wearing, it's not what I'm eating, it's what I'm saying. Now, I keep wanting to remind you the reason we're looking at John is because not only was Elijah's message bringing revival in the Old Testament, John the Baptist preached reform and revival when Christ came the first time. But Elijah the prophet will come again before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The ministry, the message of John is something the Lord wants again at the end of time. In your life and mine. What's the most important thing about you? Is it your home? Think about what makes you the most valuable. Not only that Christ paid for you, is it your car? Is it your family? Is it your position? Position? Possession? Or is it your message? God has given you a message. The most important thing that you possess is a message. A message of truth. And that was John's identity. That God had given him this message. What was the message? First words out of his mouth. Repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. It's available. It's within reach. You know, this is something like what Moses said. 
He said, the truth isn't so far away that you've got to send ambassadors. It's not in heaven. So you'll say, who will ascend into heaven and get it and bring it down to us? It's not below the sea. So you can say, who's going to get scuba gear and bring it up to us? The message is hard to reach. He said, that's not how it is. It's in your mouth. It's in your hand. It's right near you. You know, what's really sad is that the message is so accessible and yet we still don't appreciate it. It's right within reach. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And his first words were, repent. Now, I want you to notice Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then it says in verses 5 and 6 of chapter 3, Matthew, then Jerusalem and all Judea, you, the reason it says Jerusalem, it means everybody in the city, and all Judea, and all the region around Jordan, even the parts that were inhabited by some of the poor and the Gentiles, Galilee, they went out to him. Here you've got this man, a matter of fact, some of them said, the same religious leaders that rejected Jesus, when they first heard John, they said he has a demon. That's what Christ said. When John the Baptist came preaching, they said he has a demon because he was living such an austere life. And then Jesus came and he was eating and drinking. They said, you've got, you're a glutton, friend of publicans and sinners. So it didn't matter how they came, they were still rejecting the truth. Have you noticed that if people don't want to accept the truth, that doesn't matter what excuse. Jesus came and they said, you're living too wild. John came living very austere, Spartan. They said, you've got a demon. So if they don't want the truth, they don't want the truth. But here, this man clothed in camel skin and leather, he's out in the wilderness. And what he says is so important that everybody goes to hear it. And it says, they all came to him, catch this. They were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now this made me think. Confession of sin and repentance come before baptism. Now we hear about repentance and still people don't understand what that means. Repentance is a sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. You don't get baptized in order to repent. You repent and you're baptized. Connected with repentance is something called confession. Confession, and I could stop right here and take a whole sermon talking about that, is a lost art among Christians. True, we are not to confess our sins to the pastor. Sins that are committed publicly, people already know, should be publicly confessed. If you have offended a person, you should go to your brother, Jesus says, and confess to them. It's not enough to say, well, I know that I did something terrible to this person. Lord, I pray you'll forgive me for what I did to them. And the Lord is going to say, well, have you told them? So there is a place for confessing your faults to one another, James says, and praying for one another that you might be healed. Those offenses against each other should be confessed to each other. Amen? And then confessing your sins to God doesn't just mean, I think that we're living in an age where we have made Christianity very trite and cheap. And a lot of churches teach, if you want forgiveness, simply come to the altar, kneel down, repeat this 30-second prayer, and now you have everlasting life. I don't want to overcomplicate it. I do believe you can accept Jesus just like that, but then you should go home and do a real work of confession. Pray that God will reveal to you what your sins are. Pray that prayer in Psalms. Search me, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Be specific. Don't simply say, Lord, I'm a sinner, please forgive me. Well, that's general, that's true. But then confess the specifics. You may not remember every lie you've told, every evil thought, every murder you've executed in your mind. But you know that you are a gossip, a thief, haven't been faithful in your tithes and offerings. God says you're a robber. If uh, you're speaking evil against your brother, Jesus calls it murder. Thinking impure thoughts, adultery. And so when you get on your knees, you might even make a list privately. Don't let anyone get that list. And itemize and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Think about what your sins are. It's good for your soul. Humble yourself so he can lift you up. And then claim that promise in 1 John chapter 1, 
verse 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Say, Lord, I believe the blood of Jesus will cover all this. Now, one thing that happens when you specifically confess your sins is when you say, Lord, forgive me for all my gossip, you're giving the Holy Spirit permission to help you with that, specifically. When you just say, Lord, I'm a sinner, it's so, I'm a sinner, it's so general that you're not really helping the Holy Spirit address the specifics in your life. Confess your sins specifically to God and then believe He forgives you. And He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. This was the message of John. He gave specifics. You know, something else, just so I don't forget. I want to show you what I did. I'm thankful for the computer because it helps you do things that was very difficult to do before. Just last night, I was thinking about the impact of John. I decided to go through the Bible and take everything that John the Baptist said himself. And I was surprised to find all of the very words of John. Now, the Bible says a lot about John, but it's not John speaking. Matter of fact, there's almost as much in the Bible about John as there is John actually speaking. It all fits, and this is, I put it on 14 font. It's easier for me to read at that point. About a thousand words is all John says. And yet his ministry had such a profound impact, they continue to refer to him on and on through the New Testament it, it, and ministered for about one year. Very brief, but extremely powerful. And, um, and it was really helpful to me to look at what John said. He gives a lot of specifics and I'll talk about some of his specific teachings in a moment here. His message talked about the imminent... Oh, wait, let me get back to uh, the message of repentance. Acts 19, verse 4, Paul is preaching. Well, what does Paul say? John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. Here Paul is preaching years after John the Baptist is dead and gone. He's up in Ephesus and there's believers there who were baptized by John the Baptist who still didn't even know about Jesus. The ministry of John went way beyond just Judea and Jerusalem and um, the Jordan River. And he said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance saying that the people should believe on him who would come after him that is, that is on Christ. John's ministry was one of repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was some very bold preaching about specifics. Here's a quote from Desire of Ages, that book on the life of Christ, page 104. God does not send messengers to flatter the sinner. He delivers no message of peace to lull the unsanctified into fatal security. He lays heavy burdens on the conscience of the wrongdoer and pierces the soul with arrows of conviction. The ministering angels present to him the fearful judgments of God to deepen the sense of need and prompt the cry, What must I do to be saved? This is the message to bring conviction. That's what brings about repentance. People were drawn to John by his message, by the power of the word. His message was for everybody, and his message was captivating and convicting. Something about the message of John that relates to us today, John's message was of the eminent appearance of the Messiah, the eminent coming of Jesus. Do we have that message today? Again, Matthew 3, verse 11, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, the sandals of whom I am not worthy to carry. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His message was, we have a work to do. We have a message, and our message is, Jesus is coming. That was John's message. Can you see a parallel between the message of our church, our time, and the message of John the Baptist? Is the Lord coming soon? Do people need to awake? Do we have a message of repentance and confession and preparation? A message of preparing the highway for the king? His message was one of faith. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now you and I, I don't know in our day and age if we can appreciate the impact of that statement. Remember, all up until that time when they talked about lambs taking away sin, they were the furry ones. And every Jew knew that those lambs, that the sacrificial system, all pointed to the day when the Messiah would come. And of course in Isaiah 53 it itemized that the Messiah would come and bear our sins. And it was only these lambs that were sacrificed for sin, they were symbols of when the Messiah would come. When John at the Jordan River with this vast crowd, and more than one occasion, 
In the Gospel of John, twice it says he points to Jesus and says, this is the Lamb of God. For several days, Christ was camping out. They had kind of a massive ongoing camp meeting at the Jordan River where it says, all Jerusalem, all Judea. Can you imagine the tens of thousands of people that were clustered around the Jordan to hear this one guy dressed in camel skin eating honey and locusts? He must have had a powerful message. He had charisma. He must have been exuding the Holy Spirit. You ever met people like that? They walk into the room and you know, this person's got some authority. And when someone has the authority of God, John had that. They came by the thousands. And when Jesus was there at the river and he pointed and said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, everyone took a gasp. Probably pulled some birds out of the sky. They all inhaled at the same time. Everyone looked at Jesus, so unassuming. As soon as he mingled back into the crowd, they couldn't spot him. And he said, this is the one. Now let me tell you why I think that's so important. Look, he said, behold the Lamb of God. Behold. It's simply inviting you to look and to live. You don't have to take a knife and kill this lamb. You need to look and live. That takes the minds of every Jew back to the time when the children of Israel were in the wilderness... They were being bitten by these deadly serpents and they were dying and Moses was told to do something that seemed so very strange. Make a bronze snake, like the ones that were biting them, I suppose. Put it on a shepherd's crook. You know, all these shepherds had staffs and crooks back then. And hold it up. And then tell the people, if you look, you'll be healed from the venom of the serpent. That seems so strange. But that's really the gospel. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Why? So you can behold and live. It's a message of faith. You look to Jesus to be healed from the venom of the serpent. How can looking neutralize? What vaccine is in looking that will heal you from what the physiological effects of the venom are? doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to the children of Israel. Some of them refused to look because they said that's absurd and they died. Some refused to look to Jesus and they die in their sins. So when he said, behold the Lamb of God, we're being invited to live by faith in looking. That's why Christ said, except I'm lifted up. What does lifted up mean? Position of visibility. You look at him. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. He saw him and he lived. Isaiah saw the Lord. And then he was cleansed with his coal. Thief on the cross next to Jesus. He looks at Jesus, lifted up, and he's saved. Why was Paul converted? He saw the Lord. Jesus never touched him. And we look and we live. Have you seen Jesus? Have you looked to him in faith? The promise is if you do, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And if he can take away the sin of the whole world, do you think he has enough power to take yours away? Sometimes we think, yeah, he died for the sin of the whole world. We forget that means it's potent enough to take away ours. Look and live was the message of John, a message of faith. It's also a message of stewardship and relationship. I'm talking about the teachings of John right now. Go with me to Luke chapter 3, and I want you to notice something. And you don't find this in all the Gospels. Luke 3 verse 10. People come to John and they start asking him specifically, what are we to do to demonstrate our repentance? What are we to do in keeping with our baptism? What do we do? Is there something we need to do? And John said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. What's that part of the teaching of Jesus? He said, if you have two coats, impart to others. There's some parallels between the teachings of John and Jesus, aren't there? So it's a message of generosity, loving each other. If you've got two coats, give to those that don't have any. And you know, I've been uh, proud to be an American uh, lately with these hurricanes to see that the American people have not gotten tired of giving with all these hurricanes that have come through. Uh, it's, have you looked at the statistics of the billions of dollars Americans have given? Forget what the government's allocating. They're giving for us. <laughs> they tax you and then they give it. But of their own free will, Americans have given billions. Uh, very giving people. Do you know statistically, America is the most generous with all of our problems. We are still the most generous nation in the world in the per capita of our giving. And it's often even the poor who give the highest percentage. Only got two shirts, but they're willing to give one away. 
And he who has uh, food, let him do likewise. The next messenger message, tax collectors came to be baptized. And they said, what shall we do? He said, collect no more than what is appointed for you. It's okay to collect taxes, but don't be stealing. Remember, Zacchaeus said, oh, if I've taken anything extra to line my pockets, I'm going to return it fourfold. So he's talking about a message of honesty in our dealings, truthfulness. Two more commandments in there. Don't steal, don't lie. Collect no more than what is appointed. Likewise, the soldiers come to John and they say, what shall we do? He said to them, do not intimidate or don't do violence to anyone or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Again, don't kill, no violence, and be content with your wages. He wasn't saying they weren't to do their job, but sometimes soldiers would rough people up for entertainment. Now, I thought, and that was satisfaction, be content. So generosity, honesty, satisfaction were part of his message. But you know what, I, what struck me? Money had something to do with all three of those messages. Did you catch that? Property. Your extra clothes and food, share your property. Don't collect more money than you're supposed to. Don't complain about your wages. Now, I think we sometimes forget that part of repentance begins in the purse and the wallet. So this message was faithfulness and stewardship with your time and with your means. Message of John was a zealous and bold message. Christians should be enthusiastic about what they believe. If we are blasé and indifferent, and lackadaisical and ho-hum about our religion, others will not value it. John was zealous and John was bold. He was willing to share it. Are you willing to share what you believe? As a matter of fact, sometimes it's a little bit hard. Matthew 3, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said, brood of vipers. <laughs> now that's another thing. Jesus talks about sharing two coats. Did Jesus ever call the Sadducees and Pharisees snakes? Yes, he did. Remember in Matthew where he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees? He called them serpents too. Brood of vipers who warns you to flee from the wrath to come. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And don't say to you, I want to park there. Fruits worthy of repentance. Does repentance involve tangible fruit? Isn't that what John taught? Uh, there is a theology that's going around today, not just in other churches, I don't think our church is immune, that when you come to Jesus and you're baptized, you don't need to make any changes. Just come and believe. John didn't accept that. Part of his preaching and baptism gave them lots of practical changes. And he said, don't just come to my baptism. If your heart is like a viper, well, you need a change of heart and there should be fruits of change. Isn't that right? Oh, I won't say that. Yes, I will. <laughs> I'll modify it. Something that is uh, becoming more common is people who are struggling with addictions. They come to get baptized. And in order to make... See, pastors and evangelists, and I'm one of both, are under pressure to look successful. So we might baptize people who may not be ready. And they come for baptism and they say... I'm, I'm drinking and yeah, I am smoking and I'm living with someone I'm not married to but I think if you could baptize me I'd get the victory and pastors are baptizing them you should have fruits of repentance before baptism I quit smoking and drinking before I was baptized and praise the Lord I've never done it again it's a lot harder to quit afterward you kind of lose some of your incentive afterward and so, and overseas, we're getting ready, like I said, to go back to India. A lot of people are getting baptized in that country. And sometimes the pastors and evangelists say, if you get baptized, we're going to give you a free Bible or dress or something like that. And so they get baptized for these trinkets because they're very poor. And they haven't brought forth the fruits of repentance. That's what the Lord wants before baptism. And John was real straight. The religious leaders came. And he might have thought, wow, I'm making progress. I've got the religious leaders of the kingdom are here. They finally not only come from Jerusalem and Judea and around the Jordan, the temple staff has come to my baptism. I better be nice to them. Don't want to hurt their feelings. What does he say to them? 
You brood of vipers. That'll never get you elected, will it? He was fearless for the truth. Because he thought, look, I'm not going to lower the standards in order to get the accolades of people in position. They needed repentance more than anybody. So he was bold and he was zealous. And as a result of that, uh, he got into trouble. John was obedient. Think about this. Finally, the, the axle of the ministry of John and Jesus, it revolves not just on the cross, but it's in the Jordan River. In the Jordan River with Elijah and Elisha was a transfer of authority. Elijah took his mantle off and gave it to Elisha, if you know your Old Testament. And he became a prophet and he continued. As a matter of fact, he had twice the spirit. In the Jordan River, when John says, this is the Lamb of God, now John is amazed because the one he's identified as the Lamb of God walks up to him in the Jordan River, not to give his autograph or to shake hands, but he says, I want to be baptized. And John goes, whoa, I need to be baptized by you. That tells us something else about John. Not only was he humble, he was not sinless. He felt the need for repentance and close, a closer experience with God. And he says, you're coming to me? And Jesus said, do it this way now. And he didn't argue. He obeyed. John was obedient. Things all began to change from that point when he baptized Jesus. Some of John's followers began to follow Jesus. Jesus increased, he decreased. And he was happy to have it that way. He said, I am the best man at the wedding. I am to announce the bridegroom. I'm not supposed to leave with a bride. The bridegroom is. Right? Of course, there probably have been weddings where the best man leaves with a bride. But that's not how it's supposed to happen, is it? And the church is the bride. And John was happy to see the loyalty of the church transferred to Jesus. That was his job. And so this all changed at the Jordan when he was baptized. But then John is cast into prison. Matter of fact, um, the reason that that happens, you can read in, in Mark chapter 6. Matter of fact, I'm going to read this to you. Go with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, verse 17. Mark 6, verse 17. I'm going to start with verse 14. It's got a, a whole discourse here on John that gives us a little background. Now King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known. And he's speaking of the ministry of Christ. And he said, this is John the Baptist risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said it's Elijah, and others it's that prophet, or one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded, for he's been raised from the dead. And now it tells the story. For Herod had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Now, Herodias is the granddaughter of Herod the Great, who is Herod's father. Now, I'm not sure. He, he, he either married his niece or his cousin. That's already kinky right there. But uh, the, things were pretty sick in Herod's family. And he took her from his brother. Philip. And John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Philip was still alive. She just left him and bounced over to uh, Philip's brother. Therefore Herodias, a woman scorned, get out of her way. And a w wicked woman scorned is really scary. And here, how dare you say that the king cannot have me? Who do you think you are? She wants to have a hitman take care of John right, right away. Herod actually fears John because he knows he's a prophet. He trembles when he hears him preach. So Herodias held it against him and she wanted to kill him, but she couldn't. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and a holy man and protected him. He starts out protecting him. Be careful when the government says they're going to offer you protection. And when he heard him, he did many things, and he heard him gladly. At some point, the Holy Spirit was even stirring with that wicked king. And he was willing to make some changes and to accommodate. And Herodias is getting worried. She says, you know, it seems like the preaching of John is starting to get through to Herod, and I'm probably going to be out of here soon if something doesn't happen to John. So she stirred him up. You know, the Bible says Jezebel stirred up Ahab. And the Bible says that uh, Herodias held it against him. And an opportune came, uh, day came 
on his birthday, he gave a feast for the nobles and high officers. Now, I'm not going to read all of that just yet because I want to go back to some other things. Finally, she convinces Herod to have John in prison. Herod doesn't mind that much because he is afraid it's going to start an insurrection. I mean, there are tens of thousands of people there at the Jordan River. His job as a, uh, uh, an appointed king by uh, Tiberius Caesar is to keep things under control. And it turns out now it looks like things are getting a little bit out of hand. He doesn't want an insurrection, so he imprisons John, but he doesn't hurt him. He doesn't want to stir the people up. And while John's in prison, time goes by. Now, we don't know how long he was there, but it may have been months. Can you imagine how hard it would be for John to be in prison? Can you imagine going from a life where you're living in the great outdoors and you can see as far as you want and you're thirsty and there's the creek and, and you've got your, your carob and your grasshoppers whenever you want and you, you've got that freedom. You see the majesty and the openness of the hills and nature and then to be in a stinking Roman jail. Josephus says that he was imprisoned at Malchius, which is this fortress that Herod had. It was hot. It was down by the Jordan, down by the Dead Sea, the hottest place, one of the lowest places on earth, stifling, hot, to be taken and put in without any relief from a prison like that. And here he's introduced to the Messiah, and he is allowed, because Herod does many things for him, he is allowed to visit maybe through the bars with his disciples. And he gets discouraged. John has doubts in prison because his disciples say, this Messiah that you pointed out, this Jesus, he's not doing what we expected. I mean, listen to how John introduces Jesus' ministry. He says in Matthew 3, Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The Messiah will come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. He will gather his wheat into the barn. He'll burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. What did John expect from the Messiah? A fiery ministry. He's going to overthrow the Romans. Even John the Baptist was not completely immune from the false conceptions of the day. He thought that the work of the Messiah was going to be to save God's people, not only from their sins, but from their oppressors. Because after all, how can you serve God freely when you're occupied by a foreman pagan power? So he keeps waiting for Jesus to not only teach nice things, but to somehow do what King David did and lead the people of Israel against the Romans. And he's not seeing this happen. And he's beginning to wonder, and his disciples are coming back saying, he's not acting like a Messiah. He's acting very meek and humble, and, and they can't find him in a crowd, and... He's teaching, love your enemies? How could he possibly be the Messiah? Love your enemies? Where's the fire? And probably from the discouraging, questioning words of his own disciples who were jealous, the Bible says the disciples of John were jealous that the disciples of Jesus were growing. And they were stirring John a little bit and saying, he can't be the one. There must be someone else. And John now is, can you imagine thinking in prison? He's not only taken away from the wilderness he loves, He's now in the prison thinking his whole life work, his parents said, your life work is to announce the Messiah. His whole life work was about introducing the Messiah. And now he's in jail and he's thinking, did I point to the wrong one? The devil's working on him. You got the wrong one. You baptized, you looked at the wrong one. You've been out in the sun too long that day and you got confused and it was just, and you identified the wrong one as the Lamb of God. And now you've, got, you've endorsed somebody who's not doing the right work. Can you understand why he would be discouraged? So John sends his messengers, his friends, and they come to Christ with the words, Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Oh, how sad. This is the lowest point in John's life. Did I get it wrong? And you know, he may also be wondering, You're the Messiah. I'm your cousin. I'm in prison. I hear you've got power that you're doing miracles. Aren't you going to remember me? Won't you help me? Can you understand his discouragement? Now, after these messengers leave John the Baptist, I'm sorry, they, they go to Jesus and they say, John has sent us to you with a question, are you the Messiah? Do we look for another? Jesus does not even answer them right away. He acknowledges that he's heard them and then he proceeds to minister to the multitudes. He heals miraculous healing. Maybe it was a day when he also fed the multitudes. Maybe he even at some point um, 
you know, heals a leper, opens the eyes of the blind, performs these miracles, preaches the gospel. And then after a day of them standing by, waiting for their answer and watching the ministry of Christ, he said, now go tell John what you've seen. The deaf have their ears open, the blind have their eyes open, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended in me. A little rebuke for John, gentle, don't doubt. You are saved by faith. You got it right. Trust the Lord. Be patient. You know, it's almost uh, an act of mercy that John does not live to see Jesus die on the cross. Can you imagine his doubts then? This message comes back from the disciples of John to Jesus and he is satisfied that he got it right. Because he remembers the prophecy in Isaiah that the gospel would be preached to open the eyes of the blind. Christ, in other words, demonstrates Isaiah 61 to the disciples of John. They say, look, we saw the fulfillment of this. He is the Messiah. John is refreshed. He's encouraged. He's satisfied. But after the disciples of John the Baptist leave Jesus, listen to what Jesus says. What did you go in the wilderness to see? They saw the disciples of John leaving. Matthew eleven seven. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Why did Jesus say that? A reed shaken in the wind represents something that is irresolute. It's, it's vacillating. It's uncertain. It blows this way, blows that way. That's talking in the Bible about a person who's blown around with every wind of doctrine. They don't know what they believe. If anybody was resolute in what they believed, it was John the Baptist. If you went to find someone shaken in the wind, you went the wrong place because John was the most focused person who ever lived. He came to point to Jesus and he was very resolute in that. Then he says in verse 8, Matthew 11, verse 8, But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garment? Indeed, those wearing soft clothing are in king's houses. Why would you go down to the dry desert regions around the Dead Sea? to look for someone wearing soft clothing. This is the most rugged country in the world. Salt, pits and minerals everywhere. And you, you, What did you go see? What drew you? Jesus is asking them. Now does Jesus not know or is he trying to make them think? When Christ asks a question he wants us to think. What did you go to see? He asks a third time. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you even more than a prophet. Again, because many prophets pointed to Christ, John actually introduced and baptized Christ. Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit. It is baptism. What does the word Christ mean? Christos means the anointed. Jewish equivalent of Messiah, which means the anointed. When was Jesus anointed with the Holy Spirit? When he came out of the water after John baptized him. John was the one who anointed. He did for Jesus what the high priest would do for the king. When he anointed him with oil, John was the one who was be able to uh, participate in the anointing of the anointed with the Holy Spirit. He was more than a prophet. Can you see how important the ministry of John was? What did you go to see? What attracts people to people? In our day and age, what gets you on the magazine covers? Fine clothes, which indicates money or your possessions or your good looks and that's sort of hinted when it talks about fine soft clothing it wasn't his appearance it wasn't his wealth it wasn't his position what drew people to John his message it wasn't what they came to see what Jesus is saying it wasn't that you came to see anything you came to hear something it's it was the word he was a voice preparing the way for the king and finally, John's martyrdom. Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. It just doesn't sound fair that John would die in a prison the way he did. Now, I am reluctant to even read this to you, but we have to go back to Mark chapter 6 and we'll resume what happened to John in prison. Verse 21. Then an opportune day came, opportune for Herodias, when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles and high officers. In the uh, winter time, he would go down to the palace and the fortress he had built by the Dead Sea because it was actually nice at that time of year. And they had a feast. And when Herodias' daughter 
herself came in and danced and pleased Herod and those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask for me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And he swore to her, made an oath. Probably had some wine. She waited till he was drunk. Knew that he would say something bombastic like that. Whatever you ask for me, I'll give it to you. Up to half my kingdom. Trying to impress his guests. Pride goes before fall. She comes to her mother after she gets done dancing. And it was probably not a folk dance. He wanted the daughter of Herodias to dance. Probably a seductive, lustful dance. Everything about this was bad. And she went and asked her mother, Babylon and her daughters, she asked her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist. She holds a cup in her hand full of the blood of the saints. Asked for the head of John the Baptist. And immediately she came in with haste to the king. Boy, that girl had courage. She must have been heartless too. Saying, I want you to give me at once. Doesn't even want to wait. So you don't change your mind. The head of John the Baptist on a platter. You ever heard that expression? What do you want, my head on a platter? That's where it comes from. And the king was exceedingly sorry. You remember when Darius signed a decree? And then he found out that decree was going to put Daniel in the lion's den. He was exceedingly sore displeased with himself. Sometimes kings make dumb laws and they have to keep their law. He was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he was more worried about what the people thought than what the Lord thought. He didn't want to do it, but because of those who sat with him, he could not refuse her. And immediately, the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And it doesn't tell us if John had any final words. It doesn't go through. It's just very short and to the point. Soldier marches in without explanation. They probably had grown to respect John. I don't think the soldiers even wanted to do it. And they beheaded him there in the prison without any ceremony put that great prophet's head on a platter and brought it to those wicked women. Is that a picture of what the devil wants to do to God's prophets, God's messengers? And his head was brought on a platter and he gave it to the girl and the girl gave it to her mother. Here, you wanted this? Oh, what a grisly picture. And that's the end. And the Bible says his disciples heard about it. They came and took away his body and they buried it in a tomb. There's a place in Israel where they say John the Baptist is buried and uh, not far from the Jordan River. And there may be some truth to the location. But I was thinking about something. I want to end on a good note. You know, Matthew, when it talks about the death of Jesus, it says there was a resurrection. Isn't that right? Many of the graves of those who slept in the region were opened with this earthquake when Jesus died and said it is finished. And they came out of their graves after his resurrection and they appeared to many. And when Christ ascended to heaven, they ascended with him. Now, who do you think might have been in that group? Good. I think so too. I mean, if you were Jesus and here, you know, John dies feeling totally forsaken. If Elijah, and he's come in the spirit and power of Elijah, if Elijah gets to go to heaven in a fiery chariot, don't you think it would be appropriate that John gets some kind of special resurrection also? And it could be that uh, when whatever chariots came to pick up those who had raised went on to heaven, John could have been one of those. Isn't that, does that seem theologically sound to you? You know, most of all, I wanted you to think about the work we have to do, which is much like the work of, of John. We want to live with Christ through eternity. We want to be raised, whether we're translated or resurrected when Jesus comes again. Am I right? And if we want to be near to him then, we've got to be near to him now. John's whole life was about pointing to Jesus. Paul said, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives in me. That's what our mission is. And especially in these last days, God wants more who will sense the, the calling of Elijah and Elisha and John the Baptist. And he wants us to keep John before us as our example. One more thought, please. Do you know there's many similarities between the mission of John and Jesus. There's a lot of similarity. Not only are they physically related, they both died a martyr's death at the hands of their enemies and Herod had something to do with both of them. There's similarity in their teaching. They both lived 
humble lives and they pointed to Christ and uh, it's safe to say that when Christ ascended and he took that trophy of first fruits with him that John went too. Amen? I hope so. And he's near Jesus now if that's the case. I want to be near Christ and that's why I picked that for our closing hymn. Near to the heart of God why don't you turn with me and let's stand together. 495 in your hymnals. There may be some of you who need baptism. Maybe you've been baptized, but you wandered away and, and you really need to get a new beginning. Some of you maybe have never been baptized. You've never been baptized as part of the Remnant Church, and you'd like to make that decision. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and you'd like to ask for special prayer, or let us know. Or maybe, just like others who came to John, you want to say, you know, I need, I need repentance and a new beginning in my life. Dear, loving Father, we are thankful for the example of John we find in your holy book. And we see, first of all, words of comfort that we can come just like we are, words of conviction that we need to repent and confess, and then also words of commission that you have a similar work for us to do in preparing the world for Jesus' soon coming. I pray, Lord, that we can learn from this example of this godly, holy man to live lives of honesty and humility and modesty and focus, that we might be zealous and sacrificial and point everyone to Jesus. Lord, we pray that Christ can have that priority in our lives, that we can see Christ lifted up and point others to Him. Be with those who have come with special needs this morning. And also, Lord, if there are some who've made decisions for baptism, we pray that there's nothing the devil can do to deter them from that focus. Bless us in our church and our families and be with us as we go from this place to represent Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.